topic for today is oblique incidence and the concept of wave impedance. So in a previous lecture, we looked at the following problem. Here is the Z axis. This is the X, Y plane. And we had a plane wave that was normally incident on this boundary between two media. On the left, we had for Z less than zero, mu one epsilon one. And on the right, mu two and epsilon two, and that's for Z greater than zero. And we had a plane wave that was propagating parallel to the z-axis, and this would be an incident field. And we saw that we got a reflected field that then propagates in the minus c direction, and a transmitted field that goes into the second medium and propagates in the z direction. Today, we're going to be looking at the same geometry in terms of the media, but where the incident field is coming at an angle. So it is obliquely incident. It is not propagating parallel to the z-axis. The reflected field then will go off at some angle, and the transmitted field will go at some other angle. So that is the problem we're trying to attack. Now, as soon as you go to oblique incidence, um, polarization, the different polarizations start to have an effect on this reflection and transmission coefficient. So we're still going to have the idea of a reflection and transmission coefficient, but they're going to be polarization dependent. The way we're going to attack that is to look at two separate cases. One, where we describe the fields in terms of a z component of the vector, uh, of the magnetic vector potential. The az is a0 e to the minus j beta xx e to the minus j beta y, y, e to the minus j, beta z, z. We know that in that case, there is no z component of the magnetic field. So this is a TMZ field. And then we can look at the case of having only a z component of the electric vector potential. So f, zero, and then all these same factors. And we know that will have no z component of the electric field. That is a TEZ. The electric field is transverse to the z direction. And we know that if we combine those, we can represent an arbitrary plane wave. So we will break an arbitrary plane wave into these TMZ and TEZ components, and we'll see that these have different reflection and transmission coefficients. A very important constraint right up front is that we'll see that all fields must have the same x and y dependence. So imagine the, uh, let's just look at the x dependence for now. So imagine that the incident field had dependence e to the minus j beta incident x, x. The reflected field had e to the minus j beta reflected x, x. And the transmitted field has e to the minus j beta transmitted x, x dependence. Then when we go to match the boundary conditions, well, that's in the whole x, y plane. So all values of x and y, those boundary conditions must be true. Well, the fields are going to have x and y dependence. And so we might end up with expressions like e to the minus j beta incident x, x, say plus some reflection coefficient rho, e to the minus j beta reflected x, x, um, is equal to tau e to the minus j beta transmitted x, x. And that's got to be true for all values of x. But that can't possibly be true if these betas are different. Because if you satisfy it at one value of x, well, this whole thing is that both sides are functions of x. And you change the x values, and the whole equation changes. So this is only true if we can cancel these x factors, which would be true. We could do that if all of these beta x components were the same. Okay, so 
By that argument, we can see that the x dependence of all the fields must be the same. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to match the boundary conditions for all x and y values as z is equal to 0. So we'll see that all fields, therefore, have common x dependence, e to the minus j beta xx, and y dependence, e to the minus j beta y y. So that's important to note. Because then, this equation here, when you cancel out the x dependence, just becomes, say, 1 plus rho is equal to tau. That's just a simple algebraic equation with no x or y dependence, and we can satisfy those equations. And then they will be true at all points uh, at the z is equal to 0 plane. Let's begin by considering a plane wave described in terms of a z component of a magnetic vector potential. AZ is equal to A0 e to the minus j beta x x e to the minus j beta y y e to the minus j beta z z. And of course for this to be a solution of Maxwell's equations we, we know that we must have beta x squared plus beta y squared plus beta z squared is equal to omega squared mu epsilon, which we could call just beta squared. So we'll assume that is the case. Now, what are the h and e components? So if we go back to our lecture on vector potentials, you can see that for this case of having only an az, hx is equal to 1 over mu times the y derivative of az. Well, the y derivative is going to bring down for this expression a factor of minus j beta y. So we'll, we will get minus j beta y over mu, and then we'll just have the whole az expression. How about hx? Uh, I'm sorry, hy. So that's hx. That's minus 1 over mu times the x derivative of az. Well, the x derivative will bring down a factor of minus j beta x. That minus sign cancels that minus sign, leaving j beta x over mu times a z. And h z is equal to 0. So this is, as we've talked about before, a TMZ plane wave, meaning the magnetic field is transverse to the z direction. It has no z component, only x and y components, and th those are them right there. Now, because that means that the entire magnetic field is tangential to the surface where we have to enforce the boundary condition, we're going to also call this the H polarization. Now, what about the electric field? Those expressions are a little more complicated in this case. Ex is 1 over j omega mu epsilon times the second derivative with respect to x and z of az. So that will bring down a factor of minus j beta x and minus j beta z. Minus j squared is minus 1, and then you got beta x, beta z. So that'll give you minus beta x, beta z, over j omega mu epsilon, and, and you got your az. Okay, so all the derivatives, they just bring out factors here, and you always have the az along for the right. So that's ex. How about ey? That's 1 over j, mu, uh, j omega mu epsilon. The second derivative with respect to y and z of AZ, and the only difference there is instead of bringing down a beta X, you bring down a beta Y. So you got minus beta Y, beta Z over the same stuff. And EZ is minus 1 over J omega mu epsilon. The second derivative with respect to X of AZ plus the second derivative with respect 
to y of a z. So, second derivative with respect to uh, x, that would bring down two factors of minus j beta x. That'd be minus beta x squared. And then we will also have a similar thing for, for y. So that minus sign there will cancel this minus sign. And that's then going to give you beta x squared for this term. And here, with the second derivative with respect to y, you get beta y squared all over the denominator j omega mu epsilon and then az. So there are the five non-zero field components, or what we, what we call the uh, H uh, polarization. Now remember, for normal incidence, that's the case where beta z is just equal to beta, and there's no beta x and no beta y. We was very useful for us to define the ratio of ex to hy. And that was turned out to be what we call eta, which is root mu over epsilon. And that's the intrinsic impedance of the medium. And if you think about this in terms of here's, here are the x and y axes, this would be ex and hy. So they're perpendicular, 90 degree rotation between them. And then for EY, we would want to also rotate H 90 degrees, and that would become minus HX. So this would also be the ratio of EY to minus HX in that case. Well, we're going to do the same thing for oblique incidence. Uh, it's just now the result is a little more complicated because our fields have beta x, beta y, in addition to beta z. So what do we get in the current case? If we take the ratio of ex to hy, so here are ex and hy. So let's look at that up here. So ex over hy. Let's see, here's ex with minus beta x, beta z over j omega mu epsilon. 1 over hy would be the inverse of this expression. That's mu over j beta x. And of course, the az's would cancel. Here, you got a j times j is minus 1. So that cancels there. You've got a beta x. That cancels that. You've got a mu. That cancels there. And that's equal to then beta z over omega epsilon. So. In the current case, for oblique incidence, EX over HY is equal to beta Z over omega epsilon. And that looks completely different than eta. But let's see, what does that become in normal incidence? Well, it becomes beta Z would become beta. The entire wave would be propagating uh, along the z direction. There'd be no beta x, beta y. And so if you look at beta over omega epsilon, well, that's omega root mu epsilon over omega epsilon. And the omegas cancel. And this square root of epsilon takes out a square root of epsilon from there and just leaves root mu over epsilon, which is eta. So it, indeed, it reduces in the normal incidence case to what we expect it to be. So we're going to define this to be what we call the wave impedance. So we'll say this is now for this polarization. We call the H polarization. So the H polarization wave impedance, we'll write as z is equal to beta z over omega epsilon. It's a wave impedance because this is no longer just like eta, which is just only a function of the parameters of the material, because it, it's going to actually involve the geometry of the wave, the propagation direction of the wave. So we'll make that clearer later on. And you can go back and see that this will also 
be equal to the ratio of EY over minus HX. Just go back and look at those, those expressions there and verify that that is indeed true. So we have the idea now of a wave impedance. So we're going to have an incident field, a reflected field, and a transmitted field. And let's assume these are described by the incident field is some arbitrary complex constant A0, e to the minus j beta xx, e to the minus j beta yy, put that all in brackets here, and then e to the minus j beta, and now we're we're going to be over in medium one, right? Here's medium one, and this is medium two. So we'll have a z component, beta one z, times z. For the reflected field, let's assume it's got a reflection coefficient, rho tilde. We'll use that tilde because this will be the reflection coefficient for the magnetic vector potential, not for the electric field. We'll get to the electric field reflection coefficient later. All right, it has to have the same x and y dependence, and it will be in medium one, but it's going to be reflected and be propagating with respect to the z-axis to the left, so that'll be e to the plus j beta one z times z. And then the transmitted field, we'll say, has a reflection coefficient tau tilde, so this has rho tilde, all the same x and y uh, components, and it's in medium two, so it will be going to the right, e to the minus j beta two z z. Now to be solutions of Maxwell's equations, we need to have beta x squared plus beta y squared plus beta z squared, oops, I'm sorry, in medium one, beta one z, is equal to omega squared mu one epsilon one, which we could call beta one squared. And in medium two, we've got to have beta x squared plus beta y squared plus beta two z squared. That's omega squared mu two epsilon two. We could call that beta two squared. And we could solve those for beta one z and beta two z. And what would we get? We'd get beta one z would be, because we're taking a square root, so it can be plus or minus the square root of uh, beta one squared minus beta x squared minus beta y squared. And then beta two z could be plus or minus the square root of beta two squared minus beta x squared minus beta y squared. So the only option you have for the beta z component, because the beta x and beta y are fixed and they're in common for all the fields, is you can have plus or minus. And so that's what we have up here with the incident and reflected field. So now what we need to do is look at the tangential components of the electric and magnetic fields at the boundary at z is equal to zero and make sure that they are continuous across that boundary. So at z is equal to zero, of course, e to the plus or minus j beta z times z would be e to the zero, which would be equal to one. So all those z factors go away. And we have for the incident x component from our results for the x, y, and z components uh, and of the electric magnetic field, we have minus beta x beta 1 z over j omega mu 1 epsilon 1 times a0 e to the minus j beta xx e to the minus j beta y y. The reflected x component of the electric field is minus beta x. In that case, the beta 1 z is 
going in the other direction, she got a minus sign from that, minus beta 1z over the same denominator, and that same factor there in brackets. And for the transmitted field, you've got minus beta x, it's in medium 2, so beta 2z, and then over j omega mu 2, epsilon 2, and it's got a transmission coefficient, tau, tilde, and then that factor in brackets. And here, I left off the row tilde, sorry, put that in. And what are the boundary conditions? The total field before the boundary has to be equal to the total field after the boundary, the tangential components. So we must have E incident x plus E reflected x is equal to E transmitted x. And let's see, there are a whole bunch of common terms. There's, uh, right, there's a j minus beta, beta x. We can cancel that all out. And what we end up with then is beta 1z over, we'll put, pull out a 1 over mu 1 here, and then we've got omega epsilon 1. And that'll be times 1. And then for the reflected field, we get a minus rho tilde. And then on the right, we've got the same expression, but now with uh, two subscripts. So it'll be 1 over mu 2 beta 2z over omega epsilon 2. Uh, and then we've got the tau tilde. And these factors in the brackets all cancel. They're all in common. And looking at that, we can identify here beta z over omega epsilon. That's the wave impedance z1, and this is the wave impedance z2. So we end up with the following expression. 1 over mu1, one, z1, one, 1 minus rho tilde, is 1 over mu2, z2, tau tilde. So there's one exp uh, equation we have. If you go back and look at the y components of E, you'll see that all that happens is you replace the the beta x by beta y, and so since that cancels out here, the beta y will cancel out. In that case, you'll get exactly the same expression. Now we need you to look at the magnetic field components. So the y component of the incident magnetic field is j beta x over mu1 times a0 e to the minus j beta xx e to the minus j beta yy. Remember where z is equal to 0. So we have no z factor. For the reflected field, um, we've got the same factor out in front. We've got the reflection coefficient rho tilde and that same factor there in brackets. And for the transmitted field, you've got j beta x and now the mu2 be, uh, mu1 becomes a mu2 and you've got the transmission coefficient tau tilde and all the same terms in brackets. So we now look at the boundary condition that the incident plus the reflected field on the left is equal to the transmitted field on the y uh, right for these um, norm, uh, tangential components. And so we can cancel j beta x everywhere. And we, what we get then, and also canceling all the factors in brackets, we get over on the left, 1 over mu1, 1, 1 plus rho tilde is equal to, on the right, 1 over mu2 tau tilde. So we combine that with the previous, right, the, there's our second equation. If you look at the hx terms, you'll see that you end up with exactly the same expression as you're just replacing beta x by minus beta y, and that cancels out, so it doesn't change anything. So you combine that with our previous result, that 1 over mu1 
z1, 1 minus rho tilde, is 1 over mu2 z2 tau tilde. And we can solve both of those for tau tilde. So uh, this first equation just gives you that that'll be mu2 over mu1, 1, 1 plus rho tilde. And here you also got it. So you multiply both sides by mu2 and divide by z2. And you'll get mu2 over mu1, z1 over z2, 1 minus rho tilde. So now these last two expressions don't have tau tilde. They're just one equation in the one unknown rho tilde. And so you cancel the, the common mu2 over mu1 and solve those straightforward. What you get is that rho tilde is equal to z1 minus z2 over z1 plus z2. Again, z is the wave impedance in the different media. And then this first equation here gives you tau tilde in terms of that result. Mu2 over mu1, 1 plus z1 minus z2 over z1 plus z2. Write the 1 as z1 plus z2 over itself. And a little bit of algebra puts that in the form. Mu2 over mu1, 2z1 over z1 plus z2. Looks kind of like the results we had for normal incidence, but th these guys are in the opposite order, and there's this factor here, and this should be would be a z2. But remember that the rho tilde and tau tilde, those are the reflection and transmission coefficients for the magnetic vector potential. We want to look at the reflection transmission coefficients for the electric field. So we go back to our expressions on the previous board for the electric field, for the re reflected component, x component, over the incident x component. And everything cancels out except a factor of minus 1 and rho tilde. And we define this to be our reflection coefficient rho, ratio of the incident to reflected electric field. And so it's just the negative of rho tilde, and that then turns this around to z2 minus z1 over z2 plus z1, which looks like the result we had for normal incidence, except we've replaced the eta's by this z, by the wave impedance instead of the intrinsic impedance. And for the transmission coefficient, tau will be the transmitted x component over the incident x component. And that works out to be, if you go back to the previous uh, board, tau tilde mu1 over mu2, beta 2z over omega epsilon 2 times omega epsilon 1 over beta 1z. And we identify these guys as, well, that there is z2, and that is 1 over z1. So if we take this result, the mu1 over mu2 cancels the mu2 over mu1. And then this factor, that z1 in the denominator, cancels that z1 and replaces it by a z2. And so we get that that ends up being 2z2 over z2 plus z1. So our reflection and transmission coefficients for the electric field look exactly like they did for normal incidence, except we use wave impedances instead of intrinsic impedances. And we've already said that in the limit that the oblique incidence case becomes normal incidence, the z's just revert to the eta's. Okay, so that all makes sense. Now let's consider the case where we have only a z component of the electric vector potential. Fz is equal to F0 e to the minus j beta xx e to the minus j beta yy e to the minus j beta z z. We'll go back to our lecture on vector potentials. There we derive that ex in this case would be minus 1 over epsilon 
the y derivative of fz. Well, the y derivative would bring down a factor minus j beta y. That minus would cancel that minus, and that'd leave you then j beta y over epsilon times fz. Ey is 1 over epsilon, the x derivative of fz. So we don't have a minus sign here. So we'll, we will have a minus sign over on the right. And instead of beta y, we'll have beta x. So that'll be minus j beta x over epsilon fz. And the z component is equal to 0. So this is a t e z field. The electric field is transverse to the z direction. There's no ez component. We will call this the e polarization. For this polarization, the electric field is completely tangential to the surface. That's why we call that. The previous one, with the h field was completely tangential. We call that the h polarization. For the magnetic field, hx is, and this very similar to what we had in the previous case, kind of with E and H swapped and some minus signs and mu's and epsilons swapped and stuff. Very similar algebra, 1 over J omega mu epsilon. The second derivative with respect to uh, X and Z of FZ. And I'll just write that out. That's minus beta X beta Z over J omega mu epsilon times your fz and hy 1 over j omega mu epsilon the second derivative with respect to y and z <coughs> of fz and that's going to be minus beta y beta z. So instead of beta x, we got a beta y because we've got a y derivative instead of x derivative over j omega mu epsilon fz and hz um, is 1 over j omega mu epsilon, similar to what we did in the, for the previous polarization. Beta x squared plus beta y squared times fc. So in this case, let's look at the ratio of ex over hy. And what do we get? ex over hy. Of course, the fz is going to cancel. Uh, so you're going to get j beta y over epsilon, j beta y over epsilon over this term here. So we'll multiply by the inverse of that. So it'll be j omega mu epsilon over minus beta y beta z. And what happens there? Here we got a j times a j. That's a minus 1. And that cancels that minus. You got a beta y there and a beta y there. And you got an epsilon there and an epsilon there. And that leaves omega mu over beta z. And we will define that again to be the wave impedance. Well, that looks very different from the previous wave impedance. Again, let's look at it at normal incidence when beta z is equal to beta. So this would be omega mu over, and beta would be omega root mu epsilon. And what is that? Well, that's square root of mu over square root of epsilon. That, again, reduces to Eta, the intrinsic impedance. So this is the wave impedance for the E polarization. So that's very different than what we had in the uh, in the previous case when you have they they agree for normal incidence, but for oblique incidence, they're quite different. And you can verify very similar steps like we did last time. The EY over minus HX is also equal to the same Z value. Now, let's assume for E polarization that the incident field is F incident Z is some arbitrary 
complex const constant F0, e to the minus j, beta xx, e to the minus j, beta yy, put that in brackets because it'll be common to all terms, times e to the minus j, you're over in medium 1, so beta 1 z, z, and you're propagating in the, with respect to the z axis in the right, right direction. For the reflected field, let's put a reflection coefficient, rho tilde, this is the reflection coefficient for the electric vector potential, times those same terms in brackets, and now you're for the reflected field, remember, here you've got the incident reflected and transmitted. And this is the z-axis here, left and right. So with respect to the z-axis, the reflected field is propagating in the opposite direction. So this will be e to the plus j beta 1z. And for the transmitted field, we'll have a transmission coefficient tau tilde times all that stuff in brackets. And it's in medium 2, e to the minus j, beta 2, z, z. Yeah, so how do we figure out the transmitted reflected coefficients? Well, we look at the normal components at now at z is equal to 0, right? That's at the boundary. So, of course, all these z factors will become 1. And the incident x component of the electric field is j beta y over epsilon 1 times f0. Well, let's see, it's just everything that's in the brackets there. Doesn't, no change. These become 1. And the reflected field is j beta y over epsilon 1, you've got the rho tilde, and then the stuff in brackets. And for the transmitted field, it's j beta y. Now you're over in medium 2, so you've got an epsilon 2. You've got a transmission coefficient tau tilde, and all the stuff in brackets. So, the boundary condition for the electric field, the x component anyway, is that the Incident plus reflected on the left is equal to the transmitted on the right. And we're going to cancel all the common factors here. So that's the J beta Y and the stuff in brackets. And what is that going to leave us? Uh, over on the left, we're going to have 1 over epsilon 1, 1 plus rho tilde is equal to, on the right, we'll have 1 over epsilon 2. tau tilde, so we cancel the j beta y everywhere. Okay, so there's an equation. You can look at the x components of the electric field, and you'll see that in that case, you get exactly the same equation. Now let's look at the magnetic field. So let's look at the y components of the incident field. That's minus beta y beta 1 z over j omega mu 1 epsilon 1 times all the stuff in the brackets. The reflected field, well, you have a sign change for the beta 1 z, so that gets rid of this minus sign. You get plus beta 1, uh, beta y beta 1 z over j omega mu1 one, epsilon1 one, quantity in brackets and for the transmitted field looks like the incident field but with subscripts 2 so beta 2z over j omega mu2 epsilon2 two, and the common bracket term so here we've got h incident y plus h reflected y equals h transmitted y, and we're going to cancel all common terms. Let's see here. Notice the reflected field in this case does not have a minus sign. So if we cancel minus beta y uh, over j, then when we do that over here, we're going to introduce a minus sign. And so that's going to give us here beta 1z over omega mu 1 epsilon 1 
1, and then we introduce a minus here because if we cancel a minus, divide by a minus, that introduces a minus if there's no minus here to begin with. And uh, sorry for these guys, I left off my rho tilde and tau tilde. So that it'll be this guy minus that, okay, because they have different signs. They have all the other factors are the same though. And then on the right, you're gonna have, this is gonna be equal to, we cancel minus beta y over j, and that leaves beta 2z over omega mu2 epsilon 2 tau tilde. So now we recognize, remember that uh, for this polarization, omega mu over beta z is the impedance. So we recognize this as right there, other than the epsilon, we recognize there 1 over z1, and here we recognize 1 over z2. And then you also have the epsilons. So we end up with 1 over z1 epsilon 1, 1 minus rho tilde is equal to, on the right, 1 over z2 epsilon 2 tau tilde. So there's a second equation. And you can go look at the x components and see that you get exactly the same equation. You're just substituting for the uh, one of the factors there that cancels out anyway. So now we can s solve both of these for the tau tilde. And what we get then is that tau tilde from the first equation is epsilon 2 or epsilon 1, 1 plus rho tilde. And from this equation, it's epsilon 2 over epsilon 1, z2 over z1, 1 minus rho tilde. So now, these last two expressions don't include tau tilde, just only the rho tilde. We can solve for that, cancel the common epsilon 2 over epsilon 1, and the solution to that is that rho tilde is equal to z2 minus z1, or z2 plus z1. Then use the first expression to get your tau tilde. That's equal to epsilon 2 over epsilon 1, 1 plus rho tilde which we know now is Z2 minus Z1 over Z2 plus Z1. And work that out, and it's equal to epsilon 2 over epsilon 1, 2 Z2 over Z2 plus Z1. Okay. So those are the reflection and transmission coefficients for the electric vector potential. Now, what we really want are the coefficients for the electric field. So if we look at E reflected X over E incident X, and that's right here, if that's the ratio of these guys, well, that's just, uh, I'm sorry, the ratio of these guys, this over that, that's just rho tilde. So that should be our rho, and that's equal to rho tilde. So rho tilde itself is equal to that reflection coefficient for the electric field. How about E transmitted over E incidence? Well, now you're gonna have a tau tilde, but you also are gonna have one over epsilon two over one over epsilon one. That's epsilon one over epsilon two. And so tau, which is the transmitted field over the incident field is Epsilon 1 over epsilon 2 times tau tilde. Here's tau tilde. Well, that epsilon 1 over epsilon 2 will cancel this epsilon 2 over epsilon 1, and that will just leave 2z2 over z2 plus z1. So that completes our description of oblique incidence. And let's summarize. For the H polarization, the wave impedance is beta z over omega epsilon.
Well, for the E polarization, the wave impedance is omega mu over beta z. And then, using those values, in either case, the reflection coefficient for the electric field is z2 minus z1 over z2 plus z1. The same form we had for normal incidence, but with the intrinsic impedance replaced by the wave impedance. And the uh, transmission coefficient, rather, is equal to 2z2 over z2 plus z1. Up to this point, we haven't put any constraints on mu or epsilon. They could be real, they could be complex. So now we're going to assume that they are real. So we're going to be looking at lossless media. So mu and epsilon are real, so therefore so is beta, and so is eta, and so are the z's, and hence so are the rho and tau's. These are all, which are just R real. So beta is real. And beta has beta x, beta y, and beta z components that satisfy beta x squared plus beta y squared plus beta z squared is equal to omega squared mu epsilon, which is beta squared. And that looks like the Pythagorean theorem. And if we thought of beta x, beta y, and beta z as the components of a vector, beta vector, so that's the x component, there's the y component, and there's the z component, then beta, non boldface beta, would be the magnitude or the norm of that vector. And we know that's also equal to 2 pi over the wavelength. So, here are the x, y, and z axes. And we can imagine here is a beta vector. And Let's let its angle with respect to the z-axis be theta. And then if you project that back into the xy plane, let's let the angle of that projection with respect to the x-axis be phi. And in that case, that's just, uh, th you can think of those as the spherical coordinate angles. At the, the polar angle and then the azimuthal angle. And in terms of those, beta x would be the length beta, length of that vector, times the sine of theta. That's the projection of this into the xy plane. And then within the xy plane, you'd have sine and cosine of phi terms. The x component would be cosine of phi. So for beta y, you'd have that same projection, beta sine theta now times sine phi. And then the z component is just the projection onto the z-axis gets you a dot product with a hat z, and that gives you beta z is equal to beta times cosine of theta. And with these expressions, you can verify that beta x squared plus beta y squared plus beta z squared is equal to beta squared. You'll end up just getting two uh, terms that'll be uh, cosine squared plus sine squared of phi and then of theta. And so that is a geometric representation now of what we will call here the wave vector. That has a magnitude, which is 2 pi over the wavelength, and the direction is the direction of propagation, the direction of the pointing vector, of power flow in the, in the field. Now, in terms of this, let's go back and look at our wave impedances. So let's look at, for the H polarization, we had beta Z over omega epsilon. 
What is that going to be? Beta Z is beta cosine theta. So this is beta over omega epsilon cosine theta. But we already showed that beta over omega epsilon is just eta. So that's equal to eta cosine theta. So it's the wave impedance in this case, and this is for the H polarization, is the intrinsic impedance, uh, impedance times the cosine of theta times this geometric factor. Uh, represents the fact that the wave is traveling oblique to the z-axis. How about for the E polarization? In that case, we had z is equal to omega mu over beta z. And what is that? That is omega mu over beta times cosine of theta. But we also showed that omega mu over beta is eta. So this is eta times 1 over cosine of theta. So again, it's the intrinsic impedance, but now this time times 1 over cosine of theta. So where do these cosine of theta factors come from? So let's go back um, to this picture here. And realize the angle phi, um, if we just rotated the x and y axes about the z axis, we could always make that angle zero. Just bring the x axis over to line up with that projection of the beta vector. And because the boundary is the z is equal to zero plane, it's the xy plane, that doesn't change the boundary. So that is, there's no physical change involved in that. That's just reorienting our coordinate system. Uh, in a manner that doesn't change any of the physics of the problem. So let's assume we've done that, so that phi is equal to zero. So phi is equal to zero, cosine of phi is one, so beta x is equal to beta sine theta. Sine of phi is equal to zero, so beta y is equal to zero. And of course, beta z doesn't depend on phi, so it remains cosine of theta. So we have no beta y component. And then if you go back and look at all of our expressions for the, the E and H components in terms of beta x, beta y, and beta z, and so on, what you'll find is that for H polarization, beta y being equal to zero means we only have an HY, and it is equal to HY is equal to J beta X over mu A0, let's write this as E to the minus J beta XX plus beta YY plus beta Z Z. And the electric field, has only x and z components. And ex is minus beta x beta z over j omega mu epsilon. Um, and let's put this all in brackets there, times all that stuff in brackets. And ez is beta x squared, because there's no beta y, over j omega mu epsilon times all that stuff in brackets. Well, these j's and all that stuff in the a0, let's, uh, let, let's get rid of that by defining h0 to be everything here out in front of the complex exponentials. So it's j beta x over mu times a0. We're going to define that to be h0. And if we have a regular old plane wave, we know that that should be related to the magnitude of the electric field by h is equal to e over eta, the intrinsic impedance. So let's assume that's the case. So let's call this h0. What do we get? So well, let's write that here. 
h y then is equal to h zero e to the minus j beta x x plus beta y y plus beta z z. Then e x is let's see. Uh, j beta x over uh, mu a zero. So you'd have, well, here's a minus sign over j, right? Minus one is j squared. So this, that would cancel and leave you a j, j beta x over mu. That'd be there. And then we'd have beta z over omega epsilon. And then pull out the a zero from in here. So that would give us an h zero. Um, and then what's left over would be beta z over omega epsilon. And then we'd have all this stuff in the brackets. And then how about e z? Okay, let's see. Well, we want to pull out uh, j beta x over mu. So, um, 1 over j is minus j in the numerator, so pull out a j, beta x over mu, so that would leave a minus. Of course, the j beta x over mu, that's um, your, and then pull out your a0 from the, in the brackets. That's your h0. And what would that leave? It would leave then a beta x over omega epsilon. There's all that stuff in the brackets there. Okay, that's the complex exponentials. So now let's go a little farther here. So beta z, remember, is beta cosine theta and beta x is beta sine theta and beta over omega epsilon, well, that's simply uh, equal to eta, as we showed before. So this would be h0, eta, the beta z has a factor of cosine theta, and then all those complex exponentials. And for e z, we would have, uh, now beta x will pull out a beta, and then there's a sine theta, again, beta over omega epsilon is your eta. So this is minus h0, eta, and then we would have a sine theta and that complex exponential. And so if we sketch that out, what that would look like would be the following. Here is the z-axis. Here's the, the x-axis. We're assuming there's no y-dependence because we rotated things, so that would be true. So h has only a y component. That would be coming out of the board here, h, y. Suppose here is our wave vector, beta. That's the angle theta. And these results are consistent with the electric field being perpendicular to beta. That's our electric field. And notice, if this is an angle theta here, this also would be an angle theta. And the electric field would have components. Well, this would be your EZ, and this vertical one would be your EX. And that would be the magnitude of E times the cosine of theta. And that's that right there. And the EZ would be minus the magnitude of E times sine theta. There's the minus. And from what we did with our definitions, right, E0 is a to h zero. And so this is just minus e zero, and that right there is e zero. So in fact, what that is describing is just the simple plane wave that we studied, uh, propping down, uh, propagating down the z-axis, which has e, h, and the pointing vector, or in this case, the wave vector, all mutually perpendicular, and the ratio of e to h is equal to eta, that impedance. And the only difference is we've just tilted 
the angle of propagation with respect to the z-axis by an angle theta. And that tilts because in this case the h is coming out of the board. That rotation doesn't change hy, but it causes the e now to rotate over. And now the component of e that is tangent to the surface, the x component, now gains a factor of cosine theta. And so it makes sense then that when you take the ratio of the tangential component of e to the tangential component of a, you get a factor of cosine of theta. That's because the e, now you're, the tangential component is only this projection of e rather than the full e. And you can go through and do a similar thing. So this, is, this was for the, uh, the h polarization, right, where h is completely tangent to the surface. For the E polarization, now that E is completely tangent to the surface, you have just EY, and the H points out like this, and these are perpendicular. This is your angle theta, and now you've got, so this is your H, that's EY, and then you've got hx and hz and now you get a cosine factor for the h so when you take a ratio of e to h in this case you're going to get a one over cosine because the h is in the denominator and so that those are the geometric factors that lead then to this cosine in the numerator for the h polarization and the cosine in the denominator for the e polarization they're simply geometric factors by which when you have a, a wave that's propagating at some angle with respect to the z-axis, either the E or the H field is going to be rotated and its projection onto the tangent plane where we're enforcing boundary conditions is going to have a factor of cosine of theta. Continuing on with the, uh, the case of uh, lossless media, let's look at the law of reflection. So, here is, say, our incident wave vector, beta incident, it's at an angle theta. So we've got there's the x component and there's the z component. And we know that the incident field looks like e to the minus j beta xx, e to the minus j beta yy, e to the minus j beta z z. So that's the incident. And the reflected field has the same x and y dependence, but the, the beta z gets a minus sign. So it'd be e to the plus j beta z. And what does that mean? It just means we just mirror image this thing through the xy plane. And of course, in our case where we rotated things so that phi is equal to zero, there'd be no beta y component. That means we would just mirror image this, and there would be the reflected wave vector. There would be an angle theta. So what does that tell you? Well, by the way, if you wanted to get this angle here, it would be pi minus theta. If we look at it from the point of view over here in medium one, here's medium two, here's the incident wave vector and there's the reflected wave vector. This is an angle theta. That means that's an angle theta. We said already that for the reflected field, that's an angle theta. So there's the incident and there's the reflected. Notice, if we call this the angle of incidence and this is the angle of reflection, our result is that the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence. So for any polarization, the reflected field is going to come off such that the angle 
the incident field makes with the z-axis is equal to the angle that the reflected field makes with the z-axis, but on opposite sides of the z-axis. That's called the law of reflection. Another general result is called Snell's law. And so in this case, we're going to think about the incident field and the transmitted field. So here comes the incident field. And here is the transmitted field. And so the incident field, it has some angle uh, theta incident. And the transmitted field propagates at some angle theta transmitted. So, for the incident wave vector, beta x is equal to beta 1. This is over in medium 1, and the transmitted field is in medium 2. Beta 1 times sine theta incident, cosine theta incident, beta y is equal to beta 1, sine theta incident, sine phi incident, beta z is beta 1, cosine theta incident. So that is for the incident field. For the reflected, uh, transmitted field rather, sorry, Beta x is equal to beta 2 sine theta transmitted, cosine phi transmitted. Beta y is beta 2 sine theta transmitted, sine phi transmitted. And beta z is beta 2 cosine theta transmitted. Now, the beta x and the beta y have to be the same. All right, so this, those two have to be equal, and those two have to be equal. If you take the ratio of this beta x and that, uh, um, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, of the beta y and the beta x here, then what happens? The beta 1 sine theta incident cancels out, and you get that the sine theta incidence, a uh, phi incidence over cosine phi incidence, is equal to, and they do the same thing for the transmitted field, you get the sine phi transmitted over the cosine phi transmitted. They have to be equal. Well, that just says that the tangent of those two angles is equal. That means that the angles themselves are equal. So the, the phi, that, that would be the angle that the projection of the wave vector into the xy plane would make with the x-axis has to be the same for, for both of those. Okay, so we start off with that. So, uh, we can take them both to be equal to zero just by rotating our x, y axes. In that case, then let's take a look at uh, the beta z's and the beta x's. Right? So assume then that these are equal to one. This, these are all zero. That's equal to one. Okay. So let's look at the equality of the beta x values then becomes beta one sine theta incidence from this equation is equal to beta 2 sine theta transmitted. And let's write the betas. All right, and that, that would be the omega root mu 1 epsilon 1. Sine theta incidence is equal to omega root mu2 epsilon 2 sine theta transmitted. Let's divide both sides by root mu0 zero epsilon 0. Let's cancel the omegas. And let's define that, which is, of course, if you take mu1 over mu0, that's just mu1 relative. And the same for epsilon, so epsilon 1 relative. And that will be the same thing, but for medium 2, mu 2 relative and epsilon 2 relative. And let's define that term to be n. This will be n1, and over here, that'll be n2. And we're going to call that the index 
of, now let me put it over here. We're gonna call that the index of refraction. So with that definition, we've got that N1 sine theta incidence is N2 sine theta transmitted, and that is called Snell's Law. It says that as you go from one medium to another, this is called, by the way, refraction when the angle bends like this, that the product of the index of refraction times the sine of the angle of propagation remains constant. All right, so the index of refraction, if the dielectric constant, for example, increases, the index goes up. We say the material is more optically dense. So if we go into a more optically dense medium so that the n increases then the theta must decrease and that's what we've shown here All right so you go from a less dense to a more dense the propagation the wave vector tends to bend towards the z-axis and if you went in the opposite direction then it would tend to bend away that's called snell's law an important result from snell's law is that if we go from a more optically dense material into a less optically dense material, right? because N1 sine, and let's just call this theta one instead of theta incidence, is equal to N2 sine theta two. N2 is smaller than N1. That means if we come in here at some angle, that's your theta one, that theta two has to be bigger than theta one because n2 is smaller than n1 and the, these products have to be, remain the same. Well, now what if you come in at an angle theta one that causes theta two to be 90 degrees? Well then the field, the plane wave, isn't propagating in the z direction at all. It's just propagating vertically. And in fact, if you went at an angle bigger than that, you wouldn't even be able to get a field at all over in the second medium. In fact, what would happen then is that 100% of the f incident field would be reflected. And this is called the critical angle. For if that's the case, if theta 2 becomes 90 degrees, then theta 1 is called the critical angle, theta critical. So let's see what that condition is. N1 times sine theta critical well, the sine of 90 degrees is 1, so that's just equal to N2. And that just says that theta critical is the inverse sine of N2 over N1. And so any field that comes in at an angle bigger than that will be totally reflected. And by the way, here you can see why N2 has got to be less than N1, because this ratio has got to be smaller than 1, because there is no real angle that has a sine that's bigger than 1. And this is the idea behind fiber optics. So let's say you had a glass fiber and it was in just free space or air. You could have waves bouncing around in this such that as long as this angle is greater than the critical angle, that wave will just continue to be bouncing back and forth in between the sides of the, the fiber. And so it will be completely contained within the fiber. And that is called total internal reflection.